Hello and welcome back to Why You're Wrong, a new show where I look at some of football's biggest narratives to separate fact from fiction and let you know what you might be missing, as well as pointing out some mistakes of my own. And today we're heading over to Italy to take a look at a striker linked with PSG, Manchester United and Chelsea. Juventus have endured a tumultuous season, with the world's least surprising revelation that they allegedly cooked the books to hide losses during Covid, resulting in the entire board of the club resigning, multiple executives receiving bans from football activity and the team suffering a 15-point deduction in Serie A, dropping them from third place down to 10th. And while they have responded fairly well, climbing back to 7th, they remain four wins away from Champions League football and likely to spend another campaign in the continent's second tier. However, the old lady's troubles have, of course, prompted a surge of fantasy football management from fans, with players like Locatelli and Chiesa touted for moves away. And chief among these imaginary transfers is Dusan Vlaovic. The Serb rejected a bumper switch to Arsenal just over a year ago, but 12 months have only made the striker market still more difficult. And with teams like Chelsea, Bayern and United looking for a forward, the 6'3 inch striker has lumbered onto the back pages again, despite a poor campaign leaving him shy of double figures in league football with only a third of the season left to play. So the implicit argument of all this interest is that Vlaovic is a great striker who is suffering a down season and that if he moved to a more adventurous, less crime-focused club, he would rediscover the form which prompted Juve to shell out 70 million euros for him in 2022, halfway through a campaign in which he produced 24 goals and 3 assists in 36 appearances. According to the people who loved him all along, or who want their clubs to sign him, that was the real Vlaovic, and this downturn in output is on the team or even the manager. The problem with this viewpoint is that there's not much reason to favour it over the alternative. Vlaovic is currently playing at this level because this is his level. Let's look at his breakout season in 21-22. Juve's sweep for him came in January after the 23-year-old made clear that he preferred the old lady to an Arsenal side then competing for top four. And at the time, if you simply looked at the scoring charts, it made a certain amount of sense. Despite his young age, Vlahovic was in his third year as a starter in Serie A, was following up a campaign in which he netted 21 league goals and was posting 3.7 shots a game, over a shot more than Alvaro Morata and only bested in the Juve squad by Paolo Dybala, then running down his contract. But the 17 he bowed for La Viola prior to the switch came from just over 12 expected goals, suggesting Vlahovic was due a return to earth, and five of the goals he ended up with were penalties, meaning that across nearly 2,000 league minutes, the forward had scored just 12 and racked up 8 xG from open play, actually less than Morata's 9.1. Of course, he might just be a good finisher, but if we zoom out, we can in fact see that Vlaovic outperformed xG in 2021 and underperformed in 2019-20. So there's no reason to think his shooting was going to escape the gravity of the underlying stats, which ultimately shook out to 0.51 non-penalty xG per 90 minutes, a performance which you predict to yield about 18 to 19 goals over the course of another 36 appearance campaign. And to return to the present day, we can see that Vlaovic has put up almost exactly the same stats again. His 0.55 non-penalty expected goals and assists per 90 are barely different from last term. And while shots are down from 3.7 per 90 to 3, his key passes are up from 0.75 to 1.1 meaning there's only a small gap between his total contribution to the Juve attack compared to the back half of 21-22. So this frankly should not come as a surprise to anyone, but maybe Carlo Garganesi is partially right about the other elements of Vlaovic's game. Touch, movement and link-up play. Well, though Vlaovic is attempting slightly fewer passes per match in 22-23, he's completing almost exactly the same number as he did in 21-22, around 13, meaning that his pass accuracy has actually risen from his first half season in a black and white shirt. As mentioned before, he's creating more chances for teammates, the most of his career in Italy in fact, and his touch is actually more secure than it was previously, with FB ref's numbers showing that he was dispossessed 2.2 times a game last year and now is down to 1.6, while he miscontrolled the ball a whopping 4.2 times per 90 in the past and has since brought that down to 2.8. He is admittedly getting fewer touches in the penalty area, dropping from nearly 6 to 4.4, and Garganesi might be right. This could be a sign of poor movement, as could his progressive passes received, which have fallen from 7.7 .7 to 5.4. But it could also just be an inferior Juve team struggling to move the ball forward, the Bianconeri going from 39 progressive passes per game to 35, 12th in Italy, and from 23 touches in the box per game to 20. 
That could be down to Vlahovic, sure, but it also seems a general problem. Last year, Juve had seven squad members who passed into the box at least once a game. Now, they have two. There's a rule of thumb in philosophy called Occam's Razor, which is usually paraphrased as the simplest explanation is normally the best one. So in this case, rather than coming up with a critique of Allegri or some thin claim about what has changed in Vlahovic's game with no evidence, it's better simply to accept what you're seeing on the pitch now and the stats as telling the truth. This is the player he is. That's not to say this is all he'll ever be. He's young, Juve are in crisis, things do change. But would I buy him if I were Chelsea or United? Probably not. Am I pleased Arsenal didn't get him? You bet. When Chelsea signed Kai Havertz, I really thought it was a coup. They paid full freight for him, over 70 million for essentially two good seasons, but he was 20, had 38 goal involvements over those two league campaigns, and seemed to have a nice varied skill set. 2.6 shots and over two key passes in his best year, as well as two dribbles and lots of outlet passes received. He looked on the verge of stardom then and on the path to superstardom in the long term. But after three years at Chelsea, I think it's safe to say it hasn't worked out. Havertz has played off the right, up front and in the hole during his time at Stamford Bridge. And while he hasn't been bad, around 0.5 xG per 90 and a similar rate for actual goals and assists, his best return is eight last year. And Chelsea's attack has been bad too. They scored 1.5 goals a game in Havertz's first year, two goals a game in his second, and now they're at under one a game in his third. Only one of those seasons was acceptable, and Mount was a whirlwind that year. In essence, Havertz can be good if Chelsea are good, but he can't make them good himself in the way that other top attackers can, and too often he looks like a little baby boy against Premier League defenders, like football's version of Timothée Chalamet. For a long time, I thought this was a matter of him not getting a run at a consistent position or team-wide issues, but the more time goes on, the less I think there is a position for Havertz in a side like Chelsea, or more broadly, in a good side in the Premier League. Put simply, in the Prem, big teams dominate territory and possession and come up against set defences. Look at these zones of control for Germany, courtesy of the analyst. As you can see, only Bayern, Dortmund and Leipzig boast any control at all in the opposition half, as shown by the blue shading. While in the Prem, seven teams have significant dominance in the opposition half and another four have at least some. And this means Premier League teams don't get to play in transition that much. But in the Bundesliga, it's all transition all the time. These charts show how many metres attacks move forward per second for teams in Germany and England. As you can see, the slowest team in Germany is still faster than a quarter of English teams. The fastest team in England would only rank 8th in the Bundesliga. And look at Bayern and Dortmund. Bayern would be 7th in the Prem. Dortmund would be top. Big teams can only rarely play that fast in this country because defences are more conservative. You can't break on a team that's packing its own penalty area. So what does all this mean for Kai Havertz? Well, when he was at his best for Leverkusen, he was taking nearly 70 touches a game, a tally which has since shrunk by a third. And he was carrying the ball forward over four times a game compared to under two now, and receiving over nine progressive passes compared to 7.5 now. So he was constantly on the ball, constantly running into space and constantly receiving the ball in space. He had so much license to do what he wanted. Here's Sofa Score's heat map for his last year in Germany. And here's his one now. And so though he gets more touches in the penalty area now than he did then, more of those are under pressure or with his back to goal. He rarely gets the clear grass in front of him that he had at Leverkusen. In Germany, he was somewhere between a striker and a winger in a way that made sense for that league. But in England, he's not quick enough to play wide or strong and clever enough to play up front. Putting him in either position just exacerbates his deficiencies instead of playing to his strengths. This is somewhat similar to Nicolas Pepe, who was also a genuinely great counter-attacking forward with Lille, but a horrible chalk on the boots winger with Arsenal. Or Naby Keita, who thrived in the chaotic midfield melee of the bully, but gave the ball away too much and was too positionally erratic for the unflashy, reliable work required at Liverpool. Graham Potter could potentially work it out if he stays. He has a track record of using weird forwards effectively, but it's a risk in an increasingly tough league, and the best option for Havertz might be a return to Germany, where his skills are not only more visible, but make him elite. Because here, it looks like it's not going to happen. So that's why you're wrong for this week. Thank you for watching and hit us up with your suggestions of other things I got wrong, as well as your most treasured football opinions, and they might make a future episode of the show. Get your entries in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.